a little bit about myself because uh, you probably think I'm some uh, expert on uh, stained glass windows and uh, art history. I am not. It's a kind of a hobby for me. Uh, I went to a college out in Northern California called Humboldt State University, go Lumberjacks. And um, I uh, found myself taking courses in art history. And uh, when you do that, when you're, you have a major, and my major was communication and behavior, um, you find yourself taking these other classes kind of on the side, and lo and behold, you end up with a minor in something, whatever that means, right? So I have a minor in art history. So I would say it's a really, um, it's an important hobby for me. It's something that I really love. Uh, but I'm actually a psychologist uh, by training, and what um, art history and psychology uh, allowed me to do was to really bring together uh, two passions that I have. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the psychology of the, of the stained glass windows in here today, because that's where I think the, the real meaning and the beauty and the, the emotion uh, of these windows really comes from. Um, I spent a couple of long weekends uh, on, in silent retreats in uh, grad school in Northern California at uh, the Mission San Antonio de Padua, which was part of the California mission system. And we studied Jungian psychology uh, at these retreats. Uh, we were required to remain in silence during these. Uh, we had some uh, debriefing sessions. But the focus was really on discovering uh, the symbols in our lives, the, 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 the objects, the shapes, the textures, the colors, uh, and all of the things that we encounter in our dreams, in our art, in our language, and the meaning behind those symbols. And so I'm going to talk a lot about symbols today. And I uh, handed out sheets of paper to many of you, and you're probably wondering, why do I have a sheet of paper that says olive tree and a bunch of things on it? It's because we're going to explore the symbols that are contained within the stained glass windows to help us bring some meaning to what we are looking at every Sunday when we're in here worshiping. So uh, that's a little bit about me and what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm going to start just giving a little bit of context of the windows that are in this church. And I think it's helpful to know a little bit about the history of Washington Street if you don't already know that history. Uh, this building, for example, is the fourth building to bear the name Washington Street Church. The first building was built in 1803 uh, by John Harper, and it was a very modest wooden uh, structure on this site. Uh, it was a piece of property that he owned that he donated to uh, uh, the Methodist Church and uh, started the congregation here. And uh, about 20 years later or so, uh, William Martin, who you see memorialized in this central stained glass window and in the tablet out in the narthex, built the second church. And if you want to know what the second church looks like, uh, you may have wondered, what is, why do we have a painting of another church in the hallway between here and the Sunday school classes? Well, that is the second church that bore the name Washington Street Church. That church uh, was destroyed in 1865 when Sherman and uh, Union troops crossed uh, the Columbia, uh, crossed into Columbia over uh, the Congaree River, and uh, they came to this site. They actually came to the church over next door, which is uh, First Baptist Church, and they said, we're looking for First Baptist Church. Can you tell us where it is? And uh, the lore is that the custodian said, oh, it's over there and pointed at this church. Does anybody know why they were looking for First Baptist Church? That's correct. So the answer to that uh, question is that the, uh, the, the articles of secession were signed at First Baptist Church, so there were some symbolic uh, uh, reasons why Sherman wanted to burn that church down. He instead burned this church down thinking it was First Baptist Church, and so uh, the church was destroyed. So the third church was built from the ruins of uh, the second church. And in 1875, this church was built for about $25,000. Uh, and this is the church that we now know as Washington Street United Methodist Church. So, these stained glass windows have not always been here, though. The first window that was installed is the one that you see in the center there. It was installed in 1895. Uh, the, uh, the next campaign to install windows uh, happened in uh, 1914, I believe. I have to keep notes. Yeah, I've been studying all morning to make sure that I don't forget my facts. 
1914, these windows were installed that you see around you. Uh, and they are clearly sort of the, the anchor of this church now. Uh, uh, 11 different windows that you see, and you've, everybody forgets about number f six, which is actually up in the choir loft. So a lot of people think, oh, there's 10 windows in the church, so there's actually 11. The uh, final windows that were installed were the two uh, angel windows flanking that, uh, that central window, um, and those were installed in 1921, 1922. Okay, so they're the most recent windows that are here in the church. The church was designed in the Neo-Gothic uh, tradition. About 4,000 churches were built in uh, the United States in uh, 1875, so church construction was really very, very prolific uh, in the late 1800s. What makes this neo-Gothic is really sort of some of the, the, the cues that you see in uh, the way the, the building is designed. One of the key uh, sort of trick or um, cues to that are the pointed arches that you see over the doors, over all of the windows uh, in around the church. Also the use of dark wood, stained glass, dark carpeting, warm tones are also kind of a key to that neo-Gothic uh, style. During that time also, though, there was an important movement that began, and uh, it was known as the arts and crafts movement or the mission-style uh, movement. Uh, and this was, you know, uh, Gustav Stickley, uh, um, uh, Tiffany, uh, Lafarge, and then also the JNR Land Studios were a part of that, uh, that movement as well. And what you see in arts and crafts movement is a lot of, again, use of natural materials, organic materials, wood, stone, and then a lot of natural colors that you see. And, you know, if you look at the, just the, uh, the choir loft here, you see sort of this kind of buttery yellow and this robin egg blue that's used here. It's very uh, typical of kind of the arts and crafts kind of movement. Some of you who live in Shandon or other places like that have homes that were really designed in that arts and crafts sort of mission style, bungalow style uh, uh, form. So the... Um, the, the windows, uh, which y'all have come here to uh, enjoy, are really an important part that really brought this church all together uh, in uh, 1914 and then again uh, with the last two windows in uh, the 20s. And I'm going to talk first about the center window, and I'm going to talk about the windows that y'all are kind of probably most interested in, and I'm going to tell you a little secret about the windows that are in the choir loft that I think is kind of a fabulous secret. Um, and then we will uh, be done. And feel free to ask any questions you have at any point in time. I'm going to bring a microphone to you because we are recording this. Hello to folks that are watching this uh, being recorded. Um, and so uh, the only way they can hear your question is for you to say that on the microphone. If, you, if it's a quick question, I might just repeat that and I'll uh, skip coming over to you. Okay. So the first window is a precursor to what the windows are that you see here, and it is using what's known as pot glass. Pot glass is simply glass that has been infused with color, and then a lot of the uh, the design work is done using the lead framing. So you see a lot of the the kinds of of elements and uh, uh, design work is framed by leaded uh, uh, leaded framework that's put in with the glass, and so the glass is all. Uh, sort of very stable color, and to make the figures that you see, you have to piece it together like a puzzle, all right, which is very different than what we're going to see in the, in the other windows. Um, I think what's important about this window is that it really sort of represents kind of the anchor of the pulpit. It is a, um, it's a representative of the Holy Trinity, really. The crown that you see over the cross has three points to it. Almost every element you see in the, uh, the different uh, images in here is three-pointed. The little tulips that go around the edge are three-pointed. And, of course, the cross is a, sort of the ultimate symbol of the Trinity. The flowers that you see around this, and I'm not a, a, uh, a, botan a botanical scientist or anything like that, so I have sort of guessed on what the plants are that are represented in this. So anybody has any better ideas about flowers or plants that you see in these windows, by all means, feel free to correct me. But I think those are daisies that are around the cross. And I'm going to give you the first 
symbol here, the daisy. The daisy is one of the most simple flowers that we know, and it really uh, speaks to innocence and purity, okay? So that is important that we begin to recognize that, um, that our flowers that we have in these windows have some other meaning behind them, and we're going to find out what those meanings are uh, when we go through that, okay? So that's the first window that, and can you imagine coming to church here, and that's the only stained glass window that we had. And in 1901, what did we do? We built the education building behind this building, which would have blocked the light coming through that window at that point in time. Those of you that have not been up there may not realize, but there is a sort of a little room behind that. It's almost, it's maybe a foot and a half deep and it has fluorescent lights that go uh, vertically behind it. And so before you came in here, I went over by the organ and I flipped a couple light switches and that lit, lit that up. I, you know, that's a great question. The question was, are, were the openings for these windows always there? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, it, it might be that I think the openings probably were there. I think it was probably regular clear glass. If you read, um, and I don't know how many of you had the chance to uh, look at Tried by Fire, uh, this book here, I think we have several copies in our library, um, but this book um, is essentially kind of a, I, I, I like to think of it as kind of a, um, a resource guide. Uh, you can read it as a story, but it's, it's pretty difficult to read as a story because lots of names and dates and so forth. But if you go in the index and look up stained glass windows, you'll find all the sections where there are stained glass windows. So one of the things they talk about, though, uh, leading up to the installation of these windows was how hot it would get in the sanctuary. And I think that was really due to the fact there was probably clear glass in these openings here. So this helped to cool down the sanctuary quite a bit, I believe. Okay, so these windows. These windows were created by the J&R Lamb Studios. This is the oldest continually operating stained glass studio in the United States. And J&R Lamb got their start back in 1857. They were probably not even involved in the design of these because it was their great, their grandson, I believe, Frederick, that went to Europe and studied uh, art and worked with Lafarge. And frankly, a lot of people think that the, that the, the Lamb Studios took their cues from uh, Lafarge and Tiffany, but really they all kind of stole from one another. They were all watching what each other was doing. And frankly, Lafarge and um, uh, Tiffany had a, they had a row. They were not, they didn't get along. Uh, but the Lamb Studios really stayed very active. They've, um, they have uh, installed windows in probably 60 different, very, very large uh, installations. The uh, cathedral at Stanford University was done by the Lamb Studios. Uh, the United States has also commissioned them. And we, uh, in our wisdom, con commissioned Lamb Studios to do these, uh, these uh, windows. The style of glass is really important, and this is what makes it particular to that era. It's called opalescent glass. And what has been done is that different pigments and different elements have been put into the glass to create variations uh, in the colors. And so you can see, even in, in the plants, the leaves of the, of the lilies there um, have variations in the green. And so you don't have a solid color of green, you have a, a variation. And so the only thing, and the, this was part of the school of thought, was that the only thing that really ought to be painted on these windows were faces and hands. That, Everything else ought to be in the glass. And so it, they went to great pains to figure out how to blow this glass in a way that you got these variations in colors. It's called opalescent because it kind of has that iridescent feel to it, almost like an abalone shell. And uh, this is the same kind of glass that you would see in a Tiffany lamp uh, in uh, windows done by Lafarge and then also by the Lamb Studios. So that's one of the things that makes this, uh, these windows really special, um, is that uh, the, uh, the effort that goes into making opposites and glass is painstaking. Okay, so what's the, what's the, the, the thought with these 11 windows? Um, and I think, you know, I think a lot of people know this, but a lot of people don't know this when they come in here, and that is that this series of windows, 11 windows, essentially chronicles the life of Christ from birth to ascension, um, and it does so without using a single human figure, 
okay? In fact, there's no, no animal life in these whatsoever. They're, they're plants. They're just images. So uh, the, for the folks that are very, very literal in our world, we have put the gospel uh, chapter verse below each window so you know what the context is, okay? But you can also sort of go from there and look at the window and look at the context of the image and see, oh, yeah, I can see how that would be that scene. But what are the other things about it that really give us that? I think the first window is a pretty kind of clear indication that this is the birth of Christ, right? We have the star of Bethlehem at the top of the window here, okay? Um, and then we have Bethlehem below, but then we just have sort of a, sort of a landscape there. And so we are to take from this that this is the chapter, this is, this is Christmas for us right here. This is the beginning, okay? Now, this is where we start to get into symbols. I didn't talk to the artist. I don't know whether they intended to do this, all right? But based on my, uh, my exploration of my art history journey and my work as a psychologist, I don't think there's any accidents. I think that we convey things in our expression that communicate the things that we want to communicate. Carl Jung believed that we all share what's called the collective unconscious. And what's in that collective unconscious is a set of symbols and shared understandings and meanings of things that we see in the world without having to put words to it, okay? So we have a star, and radiating, radiating out from that star are, interestingly, 10 rays of light. Who has the number 10? Lucky you. <laughs> All right, y'all ready? Hold on, buckle your seat belts. Let's go. Perfection. The atomic number of neon. That's interesting. Most countries issue coins and bills with the denomination of 10. In religion and philosophy. Next. References in the Bible, Judaism, and Christianity. The Ten Commandments are considered a cornerstone of Judaism and Christianity. People tr traditionally tithe one-tenth of their produce. Oh, let me repeat that. People traditionally tithe one-tenth of their produce. Interesting. Ten plagues were inflicted on Egypt in Exodus 7 through 12. Jews observe the annual 10 days of repentance beginning on Rosh Hashanah and ending on Yom Kippur. In Jewish liturgy, 10 martyrs are singled out as a group. There are said to be 10 lost tribes of Israel. There are 10 Sephiro in the Kabbalistic tree of life. In Judaism, 10 men are the required quorum called a, is it a minion for prayer services? Interpretations of Genesis teachings suggested on the first day, God drew forth ten primal elements from the abyss in order to construct all of creation. This includes heaven or fire, earth, chaos, void, light, darkness, wind or spirit, water, day, and night. Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. In Pythagoreanism, the number ten played an important role. In Hinduism, Lord Vishnu appeared on the earth in ten incarnations, popularly known as, is it Dashavathar? Um, in Sikhism, there are ten human gurus. And last, incidentally, the Chinese word numeral for ten is also a cross. So we could get really wild about some of these symbols, couldn't we? You, you might hear all that and say, yeah, oh, come on, really, did he mean all of that? But he may have meant there needs to be ten rays in here for a reason. And we know that the number 10 now is connected to all sorts of things. And I think that in our faith uh, journey, we talk about how Jesus is really a universal uh, figure in, a, in people's lives. He's represented in lots of different religions in lots of different ways. Uh, and so we see that the number 10 is uh, uh, pretty prevalent in other religions as well. Okay, the other element that I want to point out here is a cypress tree. And I think somebody has the cypress tree. Cypress tree. In classical antiquity, the cypress was a symbol of mourning, and in the modern era, it remains the principal cemetery tree in both the Muslim world and Europe. In the classical tradition, the cypress was associated with death and the underworld. 
associated with grief. In Jewish tradition, the cypress was held to be the wood used to build Noah's Ark and the temple, and is mentioned as an idiom or metaphor in biblical passages, either referencing the tree's shape as an example of uprightness or its evergreen nature as an example of eternal beauty or health. Great, thank you for that. So, we have a tree that is a uh, sort of a death tree, a, a cemetery tree at the birth of Jesus. Why would we have that? You know, perhaps this is sort of a foretelling of this is the beginning of a life that is, uh, we know how it's going to end. Um, and so let's keep that in mind when we, uh, when we celebrate uh, the birth of Christ is that we recognize that there is a journey to be had here and we know where it's going to go. There's another element in there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip to the next uh, window and we'll, we'll talk about it then. So the next window is uh, the sermon, uh, excuse me, Young Jesus at the Temple. And if you haven't had a chance to read uh, the, uh, the scripture that's at the bottom of the window, you can tell. I think it's, it's probably like King James Version, so some of it's really difficult to spit out. Um, Wist ye not that I must be about my Father's business? Or why were you looking for me? Didn't you know, or, uh, didn't you know I would be in my Father's house? And so in this, we do have uh, some buildings that are uh, Greco-Roman uh, architecture compared to the Gothic of this church. Uh, and so it does take us back to a previous uh, point in time. And um, we have use of uh, lead to define uh, the steps in spite of using uh, the same uh, colored glass panels uh, that are on there. Okay, the third window is the Sermon on the Mount or the Do Not Worry window. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they uh, um, spin. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about uh, our life. Okay, so the third window is framed, uh, is framed differently than any of the other windows. It has this trellis work around it, and you can see the beginnings of grapevines that are growing uh, up this. We'll get to grapevines here in uh, just a minute, uh, but in the, in the background, we also see round trees um, next to the, and I, I assume that the trees that are tall and cylindrical are the cypress trees, and the short rounder trees are olive trees. Who has olive trees? Thank you, Ed. The ancient Greeks uh, smeared olive oil on their bodies and hair as a matter of grooming and good health. Olive oil was used to anoint kings and athletes in ancient Greece. The Greeks observed that the olive rarely thrives at a distance from the sea, which in Greece invariably means up mountain slopes. Perhaps the most well-known symbolic connotation for the olive is peace. The olive tree, or more specifically, an olive branch is a symbol of peace and friendship dating back to ancient Greek mythology. In Judaism and Christianity, olive oil was used for not only food and cooking, but also lighting, sacrificial offerings, ointment, and anointment for priestly or royal office. An olive branch or leaf, depending on the translation, was brought back to Noah by a dove to demonstrate that the flood was over. The olive is listed in Deuteronomy 8.8 8, as one of the seven species that are noteworthy products of the land of Israel. The Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, is mentioned several times in the New Testament. The allegory of the olive tree in St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans refers to the scattering and gathering of Israel. It compares the Israelites to a tame olive tree and the Gentiles to a wild olive branch. The olive tree itself, as well as olive oil and olives, play an important role in the Bible. The Great Seal of the United States, first used in 1782, depicts an eagle clutching an olive branch in one of its talons, indicating the power of peace. Great. Thank you, Ed. The other um, important element that we see in here, of course, would be the lily. And the lily is something that we see in several of these. Somebody has lilies. 
Lily flowers are associated with a wide range of meanings from purity and innocence to wealth and prosperity to birth and growth. The flowers represent purity, innocence, and rebirth. In religious iconography, they often represent the Virgin Mary and are also often depicted at the resurrection of Christ. Lilies are often associated with purity and innocence in the Bible. In the Song of Solomon, the lily is used as a metaphor for love and beauty. Lilies also represent resurrection and new life as they bloom in the spring, symbolizing the promise of eternal life in Christianity. Lilies can also represent femininity and fertility. In art, the lily is one of the most potently symbolic flowers, often associated with humility, devotion, purity, and innocence. They are often presented at weddings and christenings, evoking chastity, femininity, sorry, and fragility. Great. Thank you, Susan. So... The, the lily is a very important uh, symbol. We, uh, we see lilies at Easter time uh, filling the sanctuary. Uh, and then I will tell you uh, another important um, uh, use of the lily in this church that a lot of you probably have never noticed, uh, and we'll talk about that at the very end. So our fourth window is... Um, yes. That's a great question. I have wondered that myself. I originally used to talk about the fact that there were three pink lilies and about 19 white ones. And I don't, I don't really know why the pink ones are in there. Um, you know, we could, um, we could get into the symbolism of pink and, and yeah, in three, three, three of them in there. That's, that would be interesting as well. Right. We, um, that, yes, the grapevine is an important part of this as well. And certainly is a, I think, that structure around the lilies is to really sort of lead us to uh, see the presence of Christ in this scene. We're going to talk about grapes when we get around to the other windows here, uh, but yes, that was a, that's a definitely an important part of this window as well. All right, number four is uh, Jacob's uh, well, or um, Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. Uh, the pre- there's a preface uh, to this uh, that I will read to you. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And then the actual uh, scripture that's on the window is, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So there's a couple of important elements in this as well. And I think um, in some regards... This window is a little bit of a uh, sort of a foreshadowing of uh, the next window, which is the journeys into Galilee, and we'll get to that in a, in a moment. But the two things that we uh, see in here are the well and the jug. And somebody has the jug. Uh, I think you had it over here, Karen, right? Yes, this is vessel, container, or jug. Contains and carries the great mother, the womb, goddess, Mary, and wisdom. Great. Thank you. And what do we have typically contained in this jug when it's next to a well? We have water. And somebody has water. Um, As a symbol, water is rich with psychological meaning for all it represents, the source of life, Maternity, potential energy, healing, wisdom, as well as destruction. It embodies all possibilities and potentiality, both harmful and helpful. Water popularly represents life. It can be associated with birth, fertility, and refreshment. In a Christian context, water has many correlations. Christ walked on water and transmuted it into wine. These are acts that can be seen as a transcendence of the earthly condition. Christians are baptized with or in water, symbolizing a purification of the soul and an admission into the faith. However, 
Water can also be destructive, as in the biblical flood in which only Noah and his family escaped. Water drowns and erodes, wearing away even the densest of stones given enough time. Water is also one of the four elements essential to life in traditional Western philosophy. In this form, it is represented by undulating lines or a triangle pointing down. Colors commun commonly associated with it are blue or green. And we'll talk about the color green uh, here in a bit, but the color blue is a color uh, that frequently symbolizes sky uh, or the ocean, uh, expansiveness, openness, and also is a symbol of intuition. So uh, I mentioned the jug being a bit of a foreshadowing, and if we, when we get into this window here that's separated by the, uh, the balcony, this is the, um, the journeys into Galilee. And the, uh, the scripture there is, and uh, he went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing, power, healing, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Um, and so, and then we have the uh, road coming down the mountain to the Sea of uh, Galilee, and we see the blue water again repeated there. The, the um, you know, the first sort of famous uh, um, uh, miracle was converting water to wine. And so I think the jug is a bit of a foretelling that we are going to begin to see Jesus uh, perform his works. That and the fact that this particular um, scripture with the jug and the well uh, talks about it occurring at during the sixth hour. The sixth hour refers to noontime. And so if you think about this as a day, right, noontime is sort of the middle part of the day. So we're, we've reached, we're getting close to the middle of Christ's life uh, at this point in time. Um, I think somebody has uh, the um, wine as a word as well. Yes. So I wanted to talk about wine because we know that the conversion of water to wine is an important uh, story at this point. The use of wine in ancient Near Eastern and ancient Egyptian religious ceremonies was common. In Greece, wine is associated with the god Dionysus, one of the most ancient gods. Wine and vineyards were considered the source of inspiration and precious gifts of Dionysus. Wine represented the fierceness, prodigy, and mystery of this god. In Rome, Bacchus replaced Dionysus. Wine is an integral part of Jewish laws and traditions. In Christianity, wine is used in a sacred rite called the Eucharist, which originates in the Gospel account of the Last Supper and is symbolic of the blood of Christ. Wine, its cultivation, production, and consumption are mentioned more than 150 times in the Bible. Beyond its materiality, we find indications of a recognition of wine as an embodiment of what is an almost spiritual harmony between the realms of nature, humankind, and the divine. Great, thank you. I did, um, thank you for, for uh, reading that. Um, I th we don't see wine particularly in any of these, but we know we're going to get to a scene where wine is a central part of that. But we've seen the grapevine, and we're going to see the grapevine again, and we know that grapes are the origin of wine, and we know that Jesus converted water to wine. So at some point we needed to address wine uh, in, this, in this story. Uh, I did I did uh, overlook another symbol that was in um, this fourth window, and that is the palm tree. And I think it's the only palm tree in any of the windows uh, at this point. Somebody has palm tree. Uh, the palm tree. The palm branch was a symbol of triumph and victory in classical antiquity. The Romans rewarded champions of the games and celebrated military successes with palm branches. Early Christians used the palm branch to symbolize the victory of the faithful over enemies of the soul, as in the Palm Sunday festival celebrating the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. 
These elegant and beautiful trees symbolize resilience, victory, fertility, peace, and tranquility. They serve as perfect omens or amulets, reminding us of our own strength and resilience. Additionally, they provide a gentle reminder to seek inner peace and serenity. Great, thank you. Now, the, the next windows are going to be difficult for you all to see because they're behind you and they're over the, the balcony, uh, but these are three uh, windows that have been sort of brought together into a single story, and uh, these are uh, Jesus weeping over Jerusalem um, and uh, sort of the, his formal presentation into Jerusalem before going into Holy Week. Uh, and so the uh, the window on the left is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, two, his official challenge of his authority, and three, his response to his enemies and challenges. And the scripture simply is, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Um, and so we have the road into Jerusalem in this, along with olive trees. And as we recall, these uh, olive tree is peace, fruitfulness, purification, strength, victory, reward. Um, and then we have the cypress tree, which is the principal cemetery tree, which is long living, durable, indicates sacrifice, honesty, perfection, and death. We also have a wall, and the wall is a symbol of defense and protection, separation, and maintenance of convention. I think that last piece is a really interesting uh, symbol of a wall, which is the maintenance of convention, because we knew that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to really challenge convention at this point. So our uh, seventh window, again, underneath the balcony, uh, is I am the vine, ye are the branches, uh, and uh, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth mu forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And uh, this represents the discourse and prayers from the upper room uh, leading into Gethsemane. And we have the grapes and we have the vine, and we have somebody who has the, uh, the grapevine. Vines or grapevines, uh, Greek mythology, Dionysus, associated with rebirth. After his dismemberment by the Titans, he came back to life in an echo of winter pruning of grapevines, so they may bear fruit again during the next year. He was unique in that he could bring a dead person back from the underworld. Uh, ancient Romans, Bacchus. Um, associated with wine, celebration, and ecstasy, a symbol of Christ himself. The vine and branches are traditionally seen as depicting Christ and his followers. Wine, which comes from the grape, is a representation of the blood of Christ. Okay. Uh, any questions at this point? We'll move into window number eight uh, now. Um, which is the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And the quote here is, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Uh, he prays three times and finds the disciples sleeping and not keeping watch, and he is then arrested. Uh, and in this, we see uh, cypress trees. I do wonder what the tree is on the left side that sort of moves out of the, the scene. It looks like a very old kind of gnarly tree that is very, very old. Um, and I wonder what that tree might be and what, whether there is any symbolism to that particular tree. Uh, Cedar of Lebanon. Interesting. Okay, we'll have to check that out. Okay, one, window number nine, we are now into the crucifixion. Uh, and we do have uh, the uh, olive tree again. We have the three crosses uh, midway up the left panel here. We have the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, the, uh, uh, the quote here is, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom. Um, and so uh, a key verse in Mark's gospel, Jesus came into this world as a servant, indeed servant, who would suffer and die for our redemption. Um, and we are uh, looking at this from outside of Jerusalem uh, down uh, the pathway here. So I think it's interesting that our perspective of this is from outside uh, the, the, the city from beyond the wall. When we move into uh, the 10th uh, window, we are now at the resurrection 
Uh, and, and he said unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Um, and I, we, we're seeing a lot of the same symbols being used. So we spent a lot of time talking about symbols at the beginning because they're repeated throughout. And so you have a sense of what the meaning is of some of the images that are in uh, these windows. We, again, have olive trees. We have cypress trees in the back. Um, we could certainly uh, try to figure out what these reeds are here. Those could be the beginnings of uh, uh, lilies, perhaps. The leaves appear to be similar to the leaves on the lilies over here, which uh, we associate with Easter and with uh, rebirth. And the final window is the ascension. And he led them out as far to Bethany. He lifted up his hands and blessed, blessed them. And it came to pass he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Um, this, uh, this last window has always uh, interested me because there's really not a whole lot going on in it. It's a very, very basic. It's got the symbols that we've talked about. But there's nothing in this window that would necessarily lead us to believe that this is the ascension. And I'm sorry some of you have, are probably having a hard time seeing this last window here. Uh, but it... Um, it sort of, I think, is a, is a window that really is intended to uh, cause us to reflect and to really just wonder about uh, what is happening in this particular moment. It, it's sort of uh, a very peaceful ending to the beginning of our story, uh, whereas uh, these two windows are not so peaceful uh, endings. Okay, so that is the story of the windows that are uh, in this part of the church here. And I want to speak about, and let, before I move on to these windows up here, any questions before we move on? Yes. That's an excellent question. For those of you who didn't hear the question, the question was, did Washington Street give the Lamb Studios the, the scripture and say, we want windows based on this scripture? Or did, did Lamb sort of propose, let us fill your sanctuary with you know, 11 windows that tell the, the story of the life of Christ and we'll pick the scriptures. I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a really, uh, it's a really excellent question, but I don't know. Yeah. So there's another really excellent question. The question was, why, do you know why they chose not to put human figures in uh, these windows? One, one potential answer is that the, the school of thought for uh, the Lafarge, uh, Tiffany, Lamb, sort of school was for things to be very uh, pastoral, for that to be uh, images of nature. If to put in human figures meant they would have to paint them they, because they got to paint faces and hands. And so uh, the thought might be that, you know, we, we can produce for you the, the best, purest, opalescent glass windows by not doing that. So there could be a very sort of practical rationale for that. I kind of like the rationale, though, that you know, we, we don't know what these people look like. We have all of these cultural uh, um, ideas of what uh, Jesus looked like and what the disciples look like, and, and we typically recreate them in our own image. And these windows don't do that. We don't, we don't have a, a sense of who these people look like. Um, and so um, I personally, I really like that. I, I get the feeling, though, that these images are... Uh, um, faithful representations of palm trees and jugs and, you know, uh, lilies and so forth, uh, because we still have them in our world today. So, so uh, th and, that, and that's something that you, when you read about Lafarge, uh, Lamb, Tiffany, you read about the fact that they would use multiple layers in certain situations. Was there a question over here? Yes, sir. Yeah, the, so the question was, is this, is the, are these windows common? Um, I don't know if they're common in Columbia. I, I honestly can't tell you. I, I can tell you that I haven't been to a lot of churches in Columbia to look at their stained glass, so I don't know how we compare to Shandon Methodist or other places. Um, but th these are very common uh, types of windows that you would see in churches of that time. So churches built between 1880 and 1920 frequently had this kind of opalescent glass that had, uh, you know, the, the, the figures were sort of scenes of nature and so forth. There were um, certain instances where they did have human figures in the glass as well, though. So, great question. Was there another question over here? Yes. By layering, but, uh, yes, by layering, but also putting in, in blowing the glass, 
blowing those those colors into the into the glass panel. Yeah. Uh huh. They're more like teas. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what the historical, um, I don't know what the historians say about what the crucifixion actually looked like. You know, I have my, my image of Franco Zeffirelli's Jesus of Nazareth and, and that scene. I don't even think it had a full, they were all teas, but they were, it was kind of like a, a, a fence of sorts kind of across. But he was flanked on either side, right? And so they had to have that representation, I think. Yeah, Ed? Yeah, so Ed's asking about how they're protected. One way we protect them is on the outside of the church. Uh, they're covered with plexiglass. So we have plexiglass panels. And also in the Christ Church, uh, we have plexiglass over those windows as well. So that keeps them protected from elements. Uh, uh, on the inside, we, uh, we just take good care of them. But, um, you know, Lynn mentioned the restoration of these windows, and if you've been here for a while, you probably remember, you know, we have one of these with b black plywood over the top of it as it was being um, restored by Shenandoah. Shenandoah has done a lot of work for us uh, with windows. They did, uh, there's a really lovely window in the third floor youth room that um, that was re completely redone for us, and uh, it looks looks great. Okay, so let's let's sort of get to the end here. The end I think is really fascinating, and that is these two windows that were added later on. And you know, for a long time, I was just like, oh, that's really nice. Those are kind of um, you know very sort of pre-Renaissance looking angels uh, in there. We got this one angel on the left, and this other angel on the right. And, uh, you know, they, this one's holding flowers and this one's not. And then I started thinking about it in terms of what are these trying to convey to us? What, what is being conveyed in this presentation? And um, I, I have a theory, uh, whether or not this was intentional or whether this was uh, an unconscious uh, production, uh, but I'm wondering, I certainly think that we have a representation of life and death, right? And so let's start by talking about some of the symbols here. We have an angel on this side who is dressed in a green robe. What does green mean? Green, life, go, growth, good things, right? We think we, we have really strong positive associations with the color green, I think. The angel on the left, on the right, excuse me, uh, is wearing red. And what do we associate with the color red? Blood. Fire. Stop. End. Okay? So, at, at sort of a very basic level, we could say this is a representation of our lives. This is the beginning and the end of our lives, and we need to be constantly considering what we're doing in the middle, right? So, how many of you have had the great pleasure to visit the Vatican and see the Sistine Chapel? About half of the people here. There is a very famous fresco at the end of it that was done by Michelangelo, and it was called The Last Judgment. And uh, in The Last Judgment, and I'm going to ask you to, to sort of think of this how Larry Hembry would think of this, which is... This is stage right, and this is stage left, okay? And remember, uh, Jesus sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And on our right, we have an angel with outspread wings, wearing green, which means go, and holding lilies, which is rebirth. It's the resurrection flower, okay? And he's looking up to the sky, and seems very, very hopeful. And to the left, we have an angel wearing red, stop, fire, end. Arms are crossed like this. Anybody been to a Catholic church who's not Catholic? This is what you're to do when you go to take communion because you don't qualify, right? And the wings are closed. Uh, there seem to be some flowers that are dying. 
And uh, there's something else in this, in this that I never noticed, and I don't know whether it was my own psychology preventing me from seeing this, but I just recently saw it a few years ago, and that is that this angel is looking down into a graveyard, into a grave uh, site. It's an open grave. Um, you might have thought that that was a stone, but if you think about the perspective, that is the front corner of an empty grave that this angel is staring down into. So, it could just be a representation of the beginning and end of our lives, or it could be an invitation for us to consider what we do in between the beginning and the end of our lives. And the Methodists are not big on uh, talking about last judgments and things like that, but this is maybe just a subtle reminder that that is part of our, uh, our faith story, uh, that at some point we get judged. And whether that's a judgment uh, that's done to us or whether that's a judgment we just put on ourselves, this is an invitation for us to think about what do we want in our lives? Do we want freedom? Do we want growth? Do we want rebirth? Or are we headed for uh, a, a fairly bleak end? So, um, and it is flanked on either side of that uh, window that represents the Holy Trinity. The piece of paper that I'm sending around is a picture of that um, Last Judgment uh, uh, fresco, and what it shows is Christ sending people into heaven from the right and condemning people to their deaths in hell on the left, all right? Okay, this is the last thing I want to share with you, and that is um, two windows that you don't pay attention to on your way uh, out. And uh, on your way through the, the doors of this church, uh, on the left is a lily, and we know the lily is rebirth, the beginning, uh, and on the right is an iris. And it's the only place in this church where we see an iris. The iris is a purple flower, and it's associated with death, as Iris was a Greek goddess of the rainbow, which she used to travel down to earth with messages from God, the gods and to transport women's souls to the underworld. The three upright petals and the three drooping uh, sepals are symbols of faith, valor, and wisdom. So on your way out of the church, I believe you were meant to think of uh, the beginning and the ending, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And um, I always love that saying about, you know, when you look at a tombstone, it's not the years of the beginning and the ending that matter, it's the dash in the middle, right? It's the things that we do between the beginning and the ending. And uh, I think that is something that I think about when I leave, is that this is where my service begins as I go through these doors, reminded by the lily and the iris. All right, that's, um, that brings us to the end of this, and I am happy to take questions. Yeah, Alan John? The window in the uh, choir room is a replica of a Heinrich Hoffmann painting. Uh, Heinrich Hoffmann was known as the painter of Christ, and this is, a, this is a picture of the actual painting that is represented in the stained glass window that's in the choir room. And so you may have seen it as you drive on uh, Marion Street here. You can see the back side of it, but really you've got to be in the choir room to see that. There's also some windows up in the, um, uh, the stairwells going up to the balcony, and those were recent gifts. One was from um, uh, a steel magnet here in Columbia. I've got it in my notes. I haven't talked about it in ages. Other questions? Yeah. So the, yeah, so the question was about the, the windows here and the windows that are in the chapel. The windows in the chapel are really more, um, they use more of the pot glass, like that center window, so they have m much more um, uh, kind of uh, single color glass in them, but they do have a lot of painting on them as well. And uh, the the, the windows that are in the Christ Chapel are a little bit more specific to the works of Christ. Uh, and so you see, like, Christ as the physician and, and so forth. Um, and those windows were probably done in around 1960 because that's when the Christ Chapel was, was done. There's a beautiful uh, rosette above the uh, entrance to the Christ Chapel that is uh, able to be backlit because um, it is above the roof of the 
the connector between the Wesley room and the entrance of the Christ Chapel. It's kind of a, a neat effect. Um, but those are much newer windows. Um, they're, they're, they're probably not as painstakingly, the glass is not as painstakingly made as this. I would assume the assembly is much more painstaking. And the window that's above the pulpit is um, covered in, in, gla- um, in gold leaf. So it is really beautiful to look at at nighttime. And we're working on, um, if you haven't been here at night, by the way, um, give, um, give Robbie and uh, Ray Cobb a big uh, thank you for this. But they, um, they got the, the, the floodlights working on the roof of the Christ Chapel again. So now that the 60-foot spire that's above the Christ Chapel is lit up at night, we're talking about a way to somehow backlight the, uh, the pulpit stained glass that's uh, in, the, in the Christ Chapel as well. Did that answer your question? We, somebody actually wrote a really cool um, pamphlet about the Christ Chapel windows, and it's somewhere in the, the archives, I think. Any other questions? Sure. I did, yeah. Oh, thank you. My, uh, thank you for that. My encouragement to you is uh, to continue the journey of understanding the symbols that are in these. If you see a symbol that I didn't talk about, you know, Google it. What is the symbol of a round rock, you know, or, or what have you? Yeah. A passion flower around the cross, Okay. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Passion flower around the cross. That's very helpful. See, I love learning things on these tours. Somebody can tell me something that I don't know for sure. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Yes, Ed. I don't. I don't know who those are. They, the, um, you know, the, the Tried by Fire talks a lot about the Lamb Studios for these, but doesn't really talk about who. They talk about who the benefactors were that paid to get these done, but they don't talk about who manufactured them. Yeah. And I'm guessing maybe somewhere in the archives we have that information. I don't know. All right. Um, I look forward to uh, joining you for lunch. Thanks very much.